All right, well, I titled this series, Truly Knowing Him. Uh, Peter, this is his second letter to the same audience. And in this second letter, he is talking about what it means to truly know Jesus. And he seems to imply that you can have connection with Jesus and yet still be growing in the knowledge of Jesus. And you can be in Christ and yet somehow miss uh, the greatness of all that Jesus is to us. And so today uh, we're going to talk about what it means to truly know the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk in relationship with him, and then to find this peculiar freedom and this uh, awesome fulfillment in the midst of knowing who Jesus really is. So here we are in Second Peter. We begin in this very first uh, verse. He says, Simon Peter a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So first Peter is, is greeting them and he's establishing his authority. Hey, I'm an apostle. That's pretty key. I walked with Jesus, our Lord. Uh, he is no stranger to me. This is not an author that shows up a hundred years later and tries to fabricate things. This is a person that walked uh, in an earthly way, walked with Jesus Christ, uh, saw him, uh, knew him personally, was discipled by him, and is now an apostle. So with this authority, he's addressing people, but he wants to be careful. He wants you to know, hey, there's a same faith, there is a same faith, and then there's a different faith. And in fact, he is going to he is going to warn against this different sort of belief system that is out there. We're going to see this throughout the letter. Guard yourselves is basically Peter's message. Be diligent to guard yourselves. Preserve the gospel. Don't be duped. Don't be tricked. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted because this gospel is worth knowing in its purity. And so he says, you have received a faith of the same kind as ours, and that's what I want to share with you. That's what I want to encourage you in. It's not going to be a different message. It's the same message, and this is what we share together in community. And then he says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior. So whatever this common faith is, whatever it is, it involves rightness. And it involves a gift of rightness, and it is a gift of rightness that comes from God. So whatever this distracting message is, we're going to find out, will be an infiltration of ideas that go against your rightness. There will, there will be an infiltration of bogus, false, erroneous beliefs that will come in and try to do things that contradict your rightness in Jesus Christ. You know, Paul dealt with this, of course. If you look at Galatians or Colossians, he came in and taught a message, and then it was distorted. Well, Peter is saying that too. Peter is saying, in fact, at one place he says, Paul's ideas are distorted by many people. And then he's concerned about his own preaching and his own teaching being distorted. So whatever is the truth here, Peter seems to be saying right out of the gate, it involves your righteousness, a righteousness that is of God given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 2, he gives us a hint of where he's going. I mean, if you're going to really get to know this Jesus, and if you're really going to get to know him well, here's what he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. When I was a little kid, I would look up at the people who were mature or older in the faith, but some of them, not all of them, were mature and older in the faith. Some of them were just more legalistic than other people. And so sometimes you might have seen someone, you think, oh, they, are, they really know the Lord because they're stiff as a board and boring as all get out. So they must know the Lord, right? Because they are holy. Well, what we find here is, is actually the opposite. That if we truly get to know 
the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's like, there's something that is multiplied in our lives. Number one, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. We become more gracious. We let people off the hook quicker. We recognize our soft heart that Christ has given us. We start living from the heart, giving from the heart, thinking from the heart, communicating from the heart, interacting from the heart, listening from the heart. We start recognizing all that Christ has done for us, and we end up uh, acting out this grace upon grace upon grace. So how, what is the mark? Do you see what I'm saying? What is the mark of maturity here? Well, what we're seeing is that the mark of maturity is graciousness. And the mark of maturity, knowing the Lord as He really is, the mark of maturity is that we experience peace. So what I would say in that, you know, we say, well, what is peace? Does that mean just that when storms of life come that you have a smile on your face? No, I would describe it as a general stability. I mean, if we're anchored to Jesus Christ, what was once all over the place is now stable in him. It's really hard for us to each describe because your struggle, the thing that made you do this, where you were tossed back and forth, With every sea of doctrine, perhaps, that was your issue. You were tossed back and forth with every uh, wind of doctrine out there. You know, can I lose my salvation? Is God mad at me? Am I out of fellowship? Am I forgiven? How do I get more forgiven? How do I stay cleansed? How do I stay in His will? And we're tossed all around by these crazy, fear-inducing ideas. And then we find stability and we get anchored in Jesus Christ. That may be your story. Maybe your story is something totally different. I mean, you, you're worried about bankruptcy. You're worried about dealing with divorce. You're worried about your children who seem out of control. You're worried about tomorrow putting food on the table. You're worried about tomorrow. And so the enemy is very good at projecting that that movie on the screen of your mind saying, look, it's a horror film and it's happening tomorrow. And for you, stability is living in today. For you, stability is being anchored in Jesus right now and recognizing he is my secret to contentment and he is my everything. So maybe the seas and the winds that stirred you to anxiety were doctrinal. Maybe the seas and winds that stirred you to anxiety were more personal or familial. But regardless, we are all finding this idea that as we get to know Jesus as he truly is, not as the Bible belt has pictured him, but as the Bible has presented him. Let me say that again. Not as the Bible belt has presented him but instead as the Bible itself has shown him to truly be. So there is a difference between religion and reality. And what Peter here is saying is, I want you to be acquainted with the reality of who Jesus Christ really is because he is awesome. And as you get to know him in a true knowledge of him, You will experience grace upon grace upon grace being multiplied to you because that's how gracious he is and that's how gracious he is through you. And then secondly, you will know what peace and stability really are, maybe for the first time ever. So it's pretty cool to put a marker there, the mark of maturity, the mark of maturity, grace upon grace and peace. Verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Notice, through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. All right, so, you know, why are we going to have peace? And why are we going to have this uh, overflowing graciousness toward us and through us? Well, part of the reason is we get to see this. There's something we need to see. There's someone we need to know. Okay, there's someone we need to know. And then there's something that we need to see here. It's a fact about him. And here's the fact. He has already, key word already, granted past tense. He has already given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, there are two competing ideas in your mind right now. 
And as you encounter Bible Belt religion, as you encounter man-made theology, there are two possible outcomes in your thinking. Number one, I need more. Number two, I have everything I need. Let me just focus on those two for a minute. I need more or I have everything I need. Now, which one of these is going to produce peace and grace? Only one of these is going to produce peace. You are not at peace if you need to hunt and wait and hope and beg and plead for more forgiveness, more cleansing, more of the Spirit, more of Jesus, more of love, more of patience to come down like a gift package out of heaven hanging on a parachute and then you try to apply it for the day and then you try to apply it again and you try to apply it again every day as God shoots down these gift packages of new qualities that we need for the day. Now, despite our prayers imagining that God is going to pour out a new portion to us, the real truth of the matter is that we don't make a long-distance phone call. We draw from within where Christ lives. We don't make a long-distance phone call. We draw from within the core of our being where Christ lives, and He is our everything. So when it says you've been given everything you need for life and godliness, where is that everything? That everything is in Christ, and that Christ is in you. So this is why we're not waiting, hoping, begging, pleading for God to send new portions of equipping our way. But instead, there's a greater truth than that. Although God might be willing to do that, hypothetically, He has done something better than that. Although we've prayed these things in big auditoriums and churches, Spirit, come down into this place Visit me, pour yourself on me, come to be with us. Please, we beg you, be in this place. Well, that is not the gospel. The gospel is greater than that. He has given himself to you. No matter what, for the rest of your days, he will live within you, and he wants to express himself through you. He is there, he is local, he is not long distance. This is what Peter is trying to tell us that we have everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him. So if I have a false knowledge of Him, see, I'm connected to Him. Maybe I got saved by grace, but maybe I'm like those Galatians at times where I started with Jesus, Jesus plus nothing. It's all what He did. And then I got distracted, and now I'm wondering where I stand with God, and I'm asking all those Friday questions. Am I okay? Am I forgiven? I'm asking cross questions. Am I forgiven? Am I okay? Is God mad at me? Will God judge me? What does God think of me? Am I okay? We're asking Friday questions, cross questions. Well, this verse is really not about the cross. It's about the resurrection. So speaking of graduation, it's time to graduate. It's time to graduate from Friday and recognize we have peace with God. We are forgiven from all our sins. He has saved us from the wrath of God. He remembers our sins no more. It's time to graduate from Friday and rest in the reality of Sunday. This is a Sunday verse. This is a resurrection verse. This is a verse about God having already dealt with your sins. He has now equipped yourself. These are different things, your sins and yourself. He has already dealt with your sins. He has now equipped yourself. So we need to get beyond the Friday questions and graduate from the worry and the fear and the doubt. Friday means you are okay. Friday means you are forgiven. Friday means it is finished. Friday means you and God are good to go. Now can we talk about the equipping? Because as long as I'm asking, am I okay, am I cursed... Am I cursed? Am I cursed? Am I cursed? We'll never see. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Are you asking curse questions when you need to be taking in the fact that you are equipped? Are you asking cursed questions when you need to be taking in the biblical truth that you are blessed? We're asking the wrong question. We need to graduate. We need to celebrate this equipping. God, through His divine power, has given us past tense everything we need for life and godliness. What a dirty trick it would be if he hadn't. And he filled the New Testament full of verses about set your mind, don't let sin reign, be holy as I am holy. Oh, but by the way, I haven't equipped you. I haven't infused you with my life and you're still a dirty, rotten sinner. 
Do you see that? If he said, you're still a dirty, rotten sinner and you're not equipped and you have to hope and beg for more of me, but in the meantime, live holy and blameless and right. That is what a lot of folks essentially believe without verbalizing it. I'm a dirty worm, but I need to live right for God. And one day when I get to heaven, I'll finally look right and feel right and be right. Rightness is now. Righteousness is right now. You will never be any more righteous than you are right now. Rightness is right now. Yes, you're going to get a new body. But does the Bible teach that when you get a new body, it makes you more righteous? No, you are not righteous by your body. You are righteous because of the body of Jesus Christ hanging on that cross and through his resurrection life now living in you. Are you waiting for righteousness? Are you waiting for equipping? Are you waiting to be okay? Or will you graduate from Friday and celebrate this resurrection truth? It's Sunday. It's time to celebrate. His divine power has given us everything. It says he called us by his own glory and excellence. Um, do you call God excellent? What does it mean that your God is excellent? You know, in the United States of America, we have a term kind of like excellent. It's awesome, right? Would you say God is awesome? Because if your God is not awesome, then it's time to rethink your God. If your God is not amazing and incredible and excellent and awesome, then it's time to rethink what you think he did for you. Because the gospel inspires us to cry out that God is awesome, that God is incredible, that God is beyond belief, that God is excellent. And that's what Peter says here. God is glorious and God is awesomely excellent because of what he's done for us. Don't try to be thankful. Don't try to celebrate God. Instead, recognize how awesome he is. And guess what will happen? You'll be thankful. Recognize how awesome he is. And then guess what will happen? You'll celebrate him. If you run around today and this week trying to be thankful and be grateful, that'll last about six hours, maybe, if you're lucky. But the way to really be thankful is to put your eyes on the object of your thankfulness, to recognize its incredible glory. And in this case, it is a person, Jesus Christ. He is incredible. What he's done for you is so awesome. Don't try to be thankful in a vacuum. Better be thankful. Got to be thankful. Bite my lip and be thankful. Plastic smile. Got to be thankful. Instead, fix your eyes on everything that Jesus has done for you. Don't put a worm in the apple. Don't put a fly in the ointment. Don't kill it with your Bible Belt legalism. Just let Jesus be Jesus. Let the cross be the cross. Did it work? Yes. Let the resurrection be the resurrection. Has he given you everything or not? He says he has. So let's take him at his word. And what will happen from that is an automatic overflow of, wow, this is pretty cool. Wow, this is beyond measure. Wow, God, thank you, Jesus. Whoa, I had no idea. Well, verse 4, he says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So again, we're seeing some crazy words here. I mean, describing God. Man, what God has done for me is precious. I hold it in high esteem. Wow. What God has done for me is magnificent, right? Maybe put a little uh, California accent in there. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, right? So think about the awesomeness of all that God has done for you. It's magnificent. Now, there's another little phrase that comes in here that you need to think about. It's pretty radical. Would you run around West Texas? Would you run around the United States saying, I have become a partaker of the divine nature? Man, you start talking like that and people cringe. They'll call you a weirdo. They'll call you a heretic. They'll say, you're, you're talking too strong. That's just positional. You know, we've got all these master theologians telling us that every single good verse is positional, right? So you'll enjoy that one later. 
So a guy comes in with his you know, d- great divider, his ruler, his measure, and he says, all right, let's separate the really awesome verses that I don't feel yet, and I'll call them positional. And then here's the other sort of verses that talk about struggle. Yeah, that's me. So this is what happens to our theology sometimes. We got a Bible full of amazing things. Some guy who's the expert, some guy comes along and he says, let's take all the great ones because I don't feel every bit of this. I don't experience this greatness. I don't feel it today. I don't feel it yet. So therefore, it must be a lofty positional notion that is for experiential, uh, you know, experience later. So he'll push it to the side and put it in the positional bin, right? And then we say, now these are, the, these are the experiential verses. Romans 7, I'm doing the very thing that I don't want to do. Man, that is experience. That's the only truth we know. I'm doing the very thing that I don't want to do. Well, hang on. That's Paul talking under the law. He has chosen law as a way. And as a result, under the law, he's doing the very thing he doesn't want to do. But he tells us how to get free from law. We don't have to live under law. So this stuff over here, these victory passages, they're not positional for a future day in heaven. We need to recognize there's just truth. We don't toss them in bins and then discount them. So here would be one of those. A participant, a partaker of the divine nature. I guess my question is, what are we going to do with this? If Peter didn't toss it in the positional bin, what are we going to do with it? Apparently, your God is so close to you. Get this. Your God is so close to you. Your Jesus is so fused to you that he is calling you a participant in his godly nature. You you are called a partaker of his divinity. His divinity lives in your humanity. And because of this fusion, we get to participate in all that he is. Now, that's not long-distance phone calls to heaven, is it? That sounds pretty local, and it's also pretty right now. It says he's granted us these past tense, and then it says we have escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So the world is around us, and we feel, you might feel connected to the world, but did you know you're not connected? I mean, the Bible says you're not of this world. You're a stranger and an alien. So we are in a place that we are not really connected to. Verse 5, he says, Now for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. We're about to see a list of attributes. But man, if I had jumped to verse 5, if I had just started this message today with verse 5, then you would have gotten what so many people are getting today. They walk into church and they feel that the pastor told them, be good, do good, be right, do right. Now go on, I'll see you next week. And you'll notice that Peter waited. You'll notice that Paul waits in his letters. He waits until there is something about an equipping, and then he talks about the application of that. He waits until we know, first of all, I'm complete. I don't lack anything. I've got everything I need. Righteousness is mine. God is for me. His face is toward me. I am equipped. I am clean and I am close. And now he's saying, therefore, walk that way. So it is not morality in a vacuum. You could get that at your local clubs. You could get that at your local morality and ethics clubs. There's world religions. There's community groups that tell us, go out and love people, be great to people, be nice to people, follow these principles, and I'll see you next week. These are not principles. This is a person. The verse prior to this says that we now participate in someone's nature. That is God's nature, the nature of Christ. Now look at what this nature looks like. So when you see moral excellence, you need to see Christ. When you see knowledge, you need to see the knowledge of Christ. Verse 6, he says, and in your knowledge, self-control. Where does self-control come from? The Spirit of God. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And in your self-control, perseverance. How will you persevere? He who began a good work in you will carry you on to completion. And in your perseverance, godliness. Where does godliness come from? God. (laughs) Strange how that works, right? And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. The fruit of the Spirit, love and kindness. 
gentleness, peace, self-control, patience. So the, the type A flesh, the achiever, not the receiver, but the achiever type of flesh looks at this and says, all right, let me take some notes now. And I'm going to try this out this week. All right, number one, Monday, I'm going to work on self-control. All right, Tuesday, I'm going to work on godliness. Well, did you notice it doesn't really say that? It says it's all one bundle. You don't work on godliness one day, and then the next, next day work on self-control. It's all one bundle. In this, you'll find this, and in this, you'll find this, and in this, you'll find this. Why is it all one bundle? Because it's the fruit, not the fruits. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit comes in one person named the Spirit. So we don't work on fruits of the Spirit here. Have you thought about that before? You don't work on fruits of the Spirit? You don't wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to work on love today. Tomorrow I'll work on my patience. The next day you wake up, you're frustrated about not being able to handle love, so you're then impatient with yourself, right? So we're working on love, then on patience, then on kindness. We're trying to master the fruits of the Spirit. And that's not the way the Bible puts it. It calls it the fruit of the Spirit because it's of one person. So uh, he says, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Now, why? Why are these attributes important? Look at it. Here's where he goes with it. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, what's going to happen? You won't be useless on this planet. <laughs> That's where he goes. It's not behave in order to be okay. It's not behave so God will like you more. It's not behave so you'll be accepted, but behave so that you'll be useful. Trust Jesus so that you'll be fruitful. He says, if these qualities are yours and increasing. So this is what you notice sort of the passive language here. It's interesting. If they are yours, like they've been given to you, and then they are increasing. That's not something you're doing. I can't increase them. But they are mine, and then they are increasing. Do you see that language? Think about that. So that means you've been given something that is now yours that is now increasing. How would it be increasing? Growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, these things are increasing. This is a mark of the trend that has changed within you. Have you noticed there's a trend reversal? God's doing new stuff within you. So he says, you won't be useless or unfruitful. Again, we see this, the title of the series, look, in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the fake knowledge, not in our own human imagination of what the deity should be like as we emotionally march around the campfire begging him to give us a harvest and begging him to show favor and begging him to like us and begging him to accept us. That's what pagan religions do. And we're called to recognize he's already blessed us. He already likes us. He's already for us. He's already equipped us. We don't have to wonder. Now, it's very interesting that he ties all of this to your forgiveness. Look at this, verse 9. Remember all the qualities we're talking about here. He says, if we lack these qualities, what's our problem? Blind or short-sighted, having forgotten what? His purification from his former sins. So some people say, oh, don't teach that total forgiveness message. Man, that is going to result in ungodliness. Don't teach that total forgiveness message. People are just going to feel a liberty to do whatever they want, and they're going to go do a bunch of yucky, ugly stuff. Don't you dare teach that total forgiveness message. Now here we find the exact opposite. That if you lack these qualities, it's because you have forgotten the forgiveness message. Now, how does that work? Well, as I recognize my forgiveness, I start thinking, whoa, wait a minute. How pure am I? 100%? How righteous am I? 100%? How cleansed am I? 100%? Are you kidding me? Now I can walk in this way or this way? Man, seeing as I'm... Uh, Let's think about this. Seeing as I'm 100% righteous, 100% cleansed, 100% holy, 100% blameless, unified with Jesus Christ, man, it doesn't even seem like a fair choice anymore. Gosh, it's rigged. I'm, I'm recognizing I've got the power and the desire and the fulfillment all banked in this direction, trusting Jesus. 
So if I don't recognize this logic, it's because, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot the first piece. I forgot the first piece of the message. The first piece of the message is I have been purified. I am not the sum total of my sins. If I have sinned 10 million times, it doesn't matter. I am treated as if I have sinned zero times. I have no former sins on my record. They are forgiven. They are forgotten forever. That's the first piece. Okay, so now, given that that's my status, given that that's the way God sees me, given that that's reality, how should I then walk? Well, gosh, it makes a whole lot more sense to walk uprightly now, doesn't it? But again, think about the opposite. The person who has forgotten their forgiveness. The person who has forgotten their forgiveness, they're saying, I need, I'm, I'm 81% cleansed. I'm 72% forgiven. I'm 50% righteous. It's, oh, I know, it's the now and the not yet. I'm righteous, but I'm not righteous, but I'm righteous, but I'm not righteous. And they're playing this now and not yet game with their righteousness. They're playing this now and not yet game with their, their holiness and their forgiveness. And then guess what happens? The tempter comes and says, why don't you do this? And here's their first thought. Might as well. It's just one more on the pile. Might as well. It's just one more on the pile. I've already got 10 million sins. Why not 10 million and one? But if you have zero sins on your record, man, this thought sticks out, doesn't it? It sticks out like a sore thumb. And so that's what he's saying. If you lack these qualities, you have forgotten your purification. You are not the sum total of your past. Therefore, brethren, be all the more certain to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. This is not sitting around going, am I chosen? Am I chosen? Am I chosen? I don't know if I'm chosen. Don't know if I'm, I'm chosen. No, behavior is in focus here. What are you called to? You're called to love. You're called to kindness. You're called to self-control. So make sure that you understand this calling. It's not Jesus plus sin. It's Jesus plus the fruit of Jesus. So make sure that you know in the true knowledge of Jesus what we're really called to. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Is this about heaven? I'm sure in some ways it's about heaven, but don't you recognize the kingdom is right now, that Jesus brought us a kingdom, and that there is something that is abundantly supplied to you right now? And I think he just got done telling us what it is. All of the characteristics of Christ are abundantly supplied to us because we've been given everything we need. All right, well, I'm going to finish with just a few more verses here. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. Isn't that what we do together? Always reminding each other of what we already know. Don't we already know we're righteous? Oh, yeah, but we need to hear it 500 ways. Don't we already know we're forgiven? Yeah, but there's an enemy and an accuser, and we need to hear it 500 ways. We need to hear that Christ is in us and close and fused to us. We need to hear it 500 ways because we forget and because there's an accuser. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. He's going to die. Paul's gonna, his body's going to end up in a tomb somewhere. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Reminding each other of what? Well, what did we see today? What did we remind each other of today? Number one, remember grace and peace. These two things, grace upon grace and peace is multiplied to us in the true knowledge of Jesus. Are you experiencing grace? Are you experiencing peace with God? If not, get to know Jesus more. Jesus delivers peace. Jesus delivers grace every single time. We have everything we need through the knowledge of Him. No more shopping, no more hunting, no more pleading, no more begging. My wife, Catherine, she lost her driver's license. We looked for it for two days. And then eventually we found it in a wallet right where it needed to be. But that happens, right? Have you ever been searching for something? I, a friend told me recently, 
He was on the phone talking to his wife. He was on his cell phone talking to his wife, telling her, I can't find my cell phone. (laughs) True story. This is what it's like when we Christians go hunting and begging and pleading and hoping and waiting for more of what we already have. We have everything we need through the knowledge of Him. Don't lose sight of your purification. It is the first step. It is a cog in the wheel. It is part of the divine logic. If you are pure and you know it, you will think pure. If you are pure and you know it, you will act pure. All right, so be diligent and be ready to remind each other of these incredible truths. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We believe he is the best thing going. We don't want Bible Belt religion. We want truth. We want Jesus. We want the Bible as it really is, the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for revealing truth that sets us free. We thank you for the great expectation, the great expectation that as we know Jesus, that something happens within us, that it's grace upon grace upon grace, and it's peace, and we begin to see it. You never produce fear. You never produce anxiety. You always produce peace within us, Father. We thank you for these simple truths and for equipping us forever so that we always have what we need in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.